What's up, everybody? Welcome to Mike Dawes Has a Podcast. My name is Mike Dawes, and I do, in fact, have a podcast. This show is all about guitar, guitarists, and the music industry. Joining me on this journey are some friends who I've met on the road over the years, and I'm honored to share some conversations with guests I'll be meeting for the first time. Let's dive right into it. R- Randall, Randall McPhee himself, Mr. Andy McKee. How are you, my friend? It's so good to see you again. Oh, it's nice to see you, Mike. I'm, I'm doing all right. Uh... Crazy, crazy year uh, behind us now. Hopefully, a good one in front of us. But well, uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean, we'll 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 see. It's uh, for the benefit of the uh, anyone listening in the future. We're recording this on what is the date? Like the uh, is the it eighth, ten or the, uh, nine? A, cu- a couple of a couple of days post, um, sort of you know siege. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I suppose I should call it. So, yeah, uh, twenty twenty one off to a. Uh, an interesting start. We had Brexit over here as well, which is rather disruptive, but obviously we have the global pandemic. But hey, you know, it can't really get any worse, it's right? all up from here, surely. We are optimistic. <laughs> May I compliment you on your fantastic vinyl collection behind you? My gosh, for anyone oh. watching the video here, we have, what is that, Somewhere in Time, Iron Maiden? It is. You know, actually, the funny thing is I don't even have a record player. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, you know, actually, when I first met my wife, one of the first gifts she gave me was... Uh, Aerial Boundaries up there uh, on record. And then she also gave me a Leo Kotke record. Um, and so I've I've always just had a few records around and then uh, friends have gotten me some. And uh, so, yeah, the Somewhere in Time is a gift. And uh, uh, man, that, I always loved that album. That's how I got into Iron Maiden was uh, Wasted Years, seeing that video. Um, and it had all these images of Eddie, you know, in the video. I was just like, I was probably like eight years old and just thought it was the coolest thing I ever saw in my life. So that's um, the same, same here, man. I remember uh, Download Festival 2003 was the, the first sort of gig I ever went to. I was 13 and it was Iron Maiden headlining on the, uh, on the Eddie the Great tour. And, uh, you know, they bring out the big 12 foot Eddie and, you know, as a 13 year old <laughs> kid, you know, oh my God, with all the pyro and everything. That's a good record, man. I remember Wasted Years was the first. Was the first song that divided my uh, my h- sort of high school, I guess secondary school, we'd call it in the uh, in the UK. There, um, it, it divided our little metal club because it had the major chorus. You know what I mean? We were all into <laughs> yeah. our into our gloomy metal, and then it just hits that presumably G. I don't know, but you know, so um, yeah. I went a little bit old school. But man, what a great record! Per- personal favorite yeah. Iron Maiden record, then somewhere in time. Oh, it it might be um, also. Uh, you know, Power Slave would probably be right up there. Um, I like the old stuff mostly. Um, yeah, I, it's probably one of those two. You know what? I, I got to throw in Brave New World into the ring. I know it's oh. a new, it's a newer record. It's when they they got you know they got Brucey back and then they went into the long songs and everything. And mm-hmm. you know, there's some cr- absolute bangers on that. I always have this debate with my my buddy Dan. He's the one the one person the one human being that I've seen in months uh, over here in the UK, being in lockdown number three. Um, Tokyo Drift, uh, the, 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 the third episode in the lockdown series. Um, we always have this debate about Iron Maiden and we always have to throw in some respect for Brave New World. So you are a, uh, a not so secret metal fan, even though you are the, the, the king of the, um, the acoustic guitar man. I mean, you, what an impact you've had on my life and, and a lot of people's, a lot of people listening's life. Um, I'm sure, um, it's, it's been an honor to, uh, to see well, all of this music here, all this music that you've put out there over the years and get to know you as well. Um, and I think actually the first time we played together would have been, was it last, well, not last year, the, the last year, but before that at your guitar camp. Yeah. The, the, the good old musicarium. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Which is absolutely wonderful event that Andy's putting on here every summer in the uh, in in the West Coast, in Petaluma, California. I've got my nice flowery mug of coffee right here for anyone watching the video, which is which is lovely. Andy's putting on this amazing guitar camp every year called Musicarium, and we we went out there with uh, uh, Trevor Gordon Hall, uh, Callum Graham, and uh, and your new friend Vince DiCola. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, man. Um, yeah, the camp the camp's been. Uh, uh, an awesome thing to, to start doing. I guess the first one was about seven years ago. I think now, um, there was one year where I, I didn't host it, but I, uh, jumped on, uh, with John Petrucci's camp and, uh, and Tommy Emanuel's camp. And so I took a year off of doing mine that year and kind of 
made my way into theirs just to, you know, meet some new people, I guess, and all that new, make some new fans and all that. But it's been really cool. We started it in New York and uh, did it there for a few years. And now we've done it out in California for a few and really like that location a lot. Um, of course, we missed it last year, um, but we're really hoping and trying to make it happen for this year. Hopefully things have, will uh, look pretty good for that. Um by then. So that's in July, uh, out in Pasadena, California. And yeah, we're going to have you and yeah, kind of the same, same group from last year or two years ago. Um, cause yeah. it went so well. And I thought it was really a nice, diverse, you know, group of fingerstyle guitar guys. And, uh, we're going to get actually Antoine Dufour in and, uh, Muriel Anderson is going to be the special guest. And, uh, but yeah, like you mentioned a couple years ago, I had Vince DeCola. Uh, if I don't know if you're, you know, listeners. <laughs> Are familiar with him or not? But when yeah, you say when you say the word Vince Decola, just in my head, I just hear da 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 da. <laughs> yes, it's just it permanently yeah, associated with training montage and war. And man, that yeah, he's he's the guy that did the soundtrack to Rocky IV. If uh, your listeners aren't familiar with him, and he also did uh, the Transformers animated film. He did the soundtrack for that, um, and that was just a. You know, that out, that soundtrack was just really a, another kind of pivotal, uh, p- part, piece of music, I guess, for me. Um, actually, I got into Rocky music because my dad had the original soundtrack on cassette when I was little and, uh, and I would listen to that and had Eye of the Tiger on it, you know, and the original Rocky theme that was awesome as hell too. Um, and then I guess, you know, it was like, when did Rocky Four come out? Was that 1985-ish or six or somewhere in there? I, I mean, whenever Rocky beat communism in a boxing yeah. match, I, I, <laughs> that that historical moment, I, I did. Yeah, I mean, how can we forget? I yeah, mean, of so course. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so so the, the phenomenal thing about this musicarium camp that I, I, I was able to do with Andy as a guest, very, very privileged to be invited amongst these guitar peers, um, was that everyone seems to adore the Rocky IV soundtrack, which is just such a bizarre, <laughs> like, unpredictable situation. Like, I, I, I think I mentioned at the time to you, my earliest, I have two musical memories that are the catalyst uh, in terms of wanting to play music and wanting to do it as a hobby and later as a career. One was the movie The Blues Brothers, because my dad's a trumpet player and, and that kind of style was always present in the house. But when I saw Rocky IV on TV, and it was um, actually not specifically one of Vince's tunes in it, it was the No Easy Way Out, Robert Tepper, oh, sweet. kind yeah, of, you yeah. know, the Lamborghini Countach and the, <laughs> you know, the I Will Avenge You, Carl Weathers, um, we will Carl Weathers this storm together. It's just, dude, th- that rock sound just just hit me like a lightning bolt in the same way that you're talking about, you know, Iron Maiden and things, you know. And uh-huh. it's so fascinating. It's always fascinating to me how many acoustic guitar instrumentalists have come from this sort of scene and this sort of sound mm-hmm. because i mean you 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 got to open for dream theater dude what what was that like <laughs> that's madness it's absolute madness <laughs> yeah well maybe just to touch on that a little bit more but um i i, I know that john gom's another big fan of the rocky four soundtrack so yeah <laughs> I, I know what you're talking about and i think um i think what it is at least for me is just it's it was instrumental i mean at least the vince Dicola tunes and and I just, there was something I felt really, uh, I, it, it is such an epic tune, you know, training montage. And, and so I, I think, I think I was just hit by the, how powerful the music was and it didn't have any words. I think that was what it was for me that just kind of was like a light bulb, you know, and, and, uh, and so that kind of steered me in that direction of, of loving music that didn't even have words and somehow you could be moved by it. Like, what is that about? Some sort of magic or something that just kind of hit me and, uh, so that was a, definitely a big part of that for me. But, um, yeah, the dream theater thing, that also kind of ties in, I think, because, uh, Vince DeCola is really like a prog rock guy. He, he loves to, yeah. you know, write really wild stuff, uh, creative and weird time signatures and all that. Um, so I, I became a fan of dream theater when I was probably about 14 or so when Pull Me Under came out, um, uh, was on MTV and, I was really blown away. But uh, I got to admit, though, when I first got the album, I was still kind of immature and stuff. And so, you know, the next song, I think, is um, it's got this saxophone, you know, uh, and it's like Another Day, I think, is the tune that sits right after it. And so I was like, what is this Kenny G stuff? And I was like, what is this? And so I didn't really get it at the time. And then like a couple of years went by and I revisited and and I was like, man, this is all unbelievable. And I, Images and Words is uh, one of my favorite albums of all time in Awake. Um, so I've, I've kind of been a fan for a long time. And, um, and I originally, 
uh, met John Petrucci and Mike Portnoy at a uh, at a guitar um, store in Kansas City. Um, oh wow! Yeah, a friend of mine owns the store, and they were going to do this sort of in store autograph signing before their concert and all this stuff. And he called me up. He was like, "Hey, you want to go pick up um, John and Mike at the hotel with me?" and you know, maybe get to say hey to him. I was like, hell yeah. So uh, <laughs> went uh, went and picked him up and we were chatting a bit. And uh, I was like, yeah, actually, I mostly play acoustic guitar. So this was like 2003 or four or something like that. And uh, we got to the store and and before every, they let everybody in, I was like, you mind if I play you something? And they're like, sure. So I, I played Drifting and my arrangement of Africa for them. And they loved it and all this stuff. So that was like when I first met him. And then... Some years go by and I'm at the NAM show waiting in line to meet John, like at the Ernie Ball booth and finally get up and say, hey, my name's Andy McKee. And I met you like a few years. And he's like, Andy McKee, dude, I was just telling my wife about you. Dude, have you been? Blah, blah, blah. And he like wrote his email on the back of the 8 by 10 glossy. I was like, holy shit, I got John Petrucci's <laughs> email here. Oh, my God. And, uh, you know, we just kind of stayed in touch a bit. And then uh, another year or two went by and he's like, would you have any interest in opening for us? Like. We're going to do some shows in California and Mexico and Arizona. And it's like, oh, my God. And uh, so I did that. And then uh, another year went by. I was like, you want to open for us in Asia? So we did that. And it's just been uh, another. I feel like my life's been nuts, dude. I, this, this, all these things that have happened and uh, feel really like I never would have imagined. Like, what the hell? I'm going to go open for Dream Theater playing acoustic guitar in Mexico one day. That's just it. I mean, open... <laughs> I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm good friends with the guys in the band Periphery, right? And they also, right, yeah. you know, open for Dream Theater and, and, you know, it's such a big thing and they played Wembley with them and things like that. But but on a solo acoustic guitar, you know what I mean? Like, you, there's a special <laughs> thing going on there. And this is what I love about you, man. It's like, I've known you for, I've actually known you for a long time now, both as a fan and somewhat professionally. Um, but you're still, f you're just full of stories. Like every time I talk to you, I'm learning all these new wonderful experiences that you've had like that, just <laughs> meet, meeting your favorite band and then being able to open with them, um, open for them a few years later. It almost reminds me of that movie Rockstar, you know, uh, where there's like the tribute band singer in the front row ends up joining the band. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> not, not quite, yeah. but, 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 but almost, you know, um, with, with yeah. good old, good old Marky Mark. Um, that's, it's amazing, man. Just, just to imagine that opening for your um your favorite band is, is just is just a huge thing i remember back at school i was introduced to dream theater through scenes from a memory um oh, okay. and my, yeah. my buddy brought in uh live scenes from new york uh the live dvd as dvds were a thing i guess they still are a thing maybe i don't know um and uh and then the the actual album i got into and i remember i i bought scenes from a memory three times because the CD just eventually got worn out and I just had to keep listening. And I, and I tried learning. I, I got pretty close to to being able to play a lot of those tunes on electric guitar. Um, of yeah, course, awesome. we're, we're, we're talking back then when your guitar tuition uh, access in small town UK was your guitar teacher's paper binder of what this this is what you will learn nothing more nothing less <laughs> now i'm seeing all these players that can just play this stuff at the age of like four years old because of access to just amazing access to information and youtube and things and that's obviously where um well m maybe not obviously to some people but that's certainly how i discovered you man because um it strikes me now that there might be um, given that we are now in the year of our Lord 2021, there might be some people who are into guitar now who might not have been into guitar back in, say, 2006 or even, you know, ha had access to that kind of thing. But back when YouTube started, you were YouTube, dude. You were the <laughs> guitar on YouTube. I mean, how, uh, I mean, I, I just checked earlier and your um, your original, you know, the classic dr drifting video is sitting something like 60 million, you know, YouTube YouTubian views, um, which translates <laughs> somewhat, as is evidenced, into into an incredible uh, opportunity to to show your music to to the entire planet and tour the planet. Has um in your eyes has much changed with with YouTube since then? And and obviously, do you do you put uh, heavy weight onto that to begin with in the early part of your career? Uh, yeah, I think it's definitely changed. You know, I mean, the platform was really. Uh, you know, kind of a proto state, I guess the whole idea of having a website that, you know, you, anybody could host videos. And I think it was just really, uh, not as refined at all as it is now. Um, 
because back then, you know, like when I had my videos go viral, it was kind of like a search bar and then some suggested videos that everybody saw. If you went to YouTube, you would see these seven videos and they'd just kind of like go by each day adding another one or something. So when my video was on that front page, like everybody saw it. Um, and so that was kind of uh, different from now where now I guess it's just all kind of what they think you're going to like and they just kind of give you that stuff. So, um, but uh, yeah, I mean, it definitely it, it changed my life and and brought my music to people all over the world. Like you said, I mean, I, I'd started to make little inroads with my career just prior to that, like in 2003 and four, I had some opportunities to go tour and uh, played in, in Taiwan and uh, Belgium and uh, Japan. And uh, this was, this was when you had hair. Yes. Yeah. Yes. When I, when I, Hey, I still got a little bit. Yeah. yeah still- <laughs> I, I stole it. I stole it all. I, I, uh, I've taken the, yeah. uh, the bridge troll look <laughs> and, and rolled with it until now. <laughs> yeah. Back when I was able to have long hair that, I mean, it was always really thin and wispy. So I just made this preemptive strike and was like, Phew. but, uh, yeah, but back when I had the long hair and, uh, yeah, it's, you know, some folks heard about me over there. I, I get, uh, that's kind of a long story, I guess. But well, well uh, I just 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 to cut in on that, I mean, I, I'm yeah. really curious as to how you know. I always hear. I, I've never really talked to you about this, but you know, the Andy McKee YouTube explosion happened, but not a lot of people are aware that you were a world touring musician prior to that. You know, and this is something that I I encounter a lot on my my work with um with Justin Hayward. I have a session gig with the frontman of the Moody Blues for a long time, and inevitably, uh, a lot of people discover me through that. Uh, but they don't. They're they're very unaware of the other stuff that I've done before that, you know. So I'm just curious. In a pre YouTube world, how were you? How were you getting those shows? You know, how were you world touring pre YouTube? It seems like such a foreign concept for a 31 year old uh, yeah. myself. You know, the world was, must have just been totally different. Yeah, it was. I mean, um, well, I, I guess uh, I'll try not to take too much time, but uh, uh, I. I had initially been, um, oh, I was a guitar teacher here in Topeka, Kansas, where I live. And, and, uh, one of my students had told me about this international fingerstyle guitar competition that's actually held in Kansas. And so I was like, wow. And so we went and checked it out just as, you know, to see it. And it's at this big bluegrass festival that's really amazing. Um, and, uh, you know, I saw it and I was like, well, maybe I'll try it next year, just see what happens. And so I went and tried it out in the year 2000. And, uh, I didn't get anywhere in the competition. I did a, a cover of a, I think a Don Ross tune and maybe a Preston Reed tune. I, I'm not even sure which ones right now, but, um, but the judges are sophisticated. And I think they knew that those were cover tunes and they were like, well, we're not going to let that go. So I said, well, maybe I'll do original stuff next year. So I went back uh, in 2001 and did all original stuff. And that, that year I got third place. And so I got like a, a guitar and a trophy and uh, the other two winners, I, I'd like to mention them too, in case you're, Listeners don't know him. The first place was Richard Smith. He's a really great uh, sort of Travis style Jerry Reed player from the UK who now resides in Nashville. And then Mark Cruz, uh, who's the brother of Edgar Cruz, both really great guitarists uh, from Oklahoma. So uh, anyway, I got third place in that. And, you know, I, I was like, oh, I can put that on my website. I got the domain andymckee.com, you know, and and put that up there. It's like, <laughs> oh, maybe stuff will happen, you know. And um, and then do you know uh, Poo-san in uh, Japan? Poo? I, I've, I, I've never been to Japan. Um, okay. No, no, I, 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 I do not know, know Poo-san. Um, okay. I, I would love, I, I have heard you mention, uh, was, was he sort of covering the Fingerstyle promotions in that region? Well, yeah, well, he, he's always had like a record store in uh, in Kyoto, and he's always been just a big fan of like acoustic guitar. And so, right, okay. he, yeah, and so he I think he heard about me because of the Winfield thing, which is the Bluegrass Festival. Um, and so he wanted to import my album. I was like, what the? That was the first thing. It was like really crazy. And because uh, I was selling these little CDs, you know, at the coffee shop gigs I do here in town. And so I was like, whoa, they, I'm big in Japan, you know, like they say. Yeah, big in Japan. <laughs> Budokan. Next stop, Budokan. Yeah, next stop, Budokan, for sure. Um, and so that was the first little <laughs> inkling. And then uh, and then I got an email from this guy in, in Taiwan. Um, and uh, and he was like, we'd like to have you come do some shows. And I was like, what in the world? This is really, I don't even have a passport. I've never, never even like been out of Kansas oh, wow. hardly. What oh, the- so, so the, the, the middle of America not having a passport thing is normal. 
Oh uh, yeah. Because everybody here has, you get a passport when you're old enough. You just, well, everyone's old enough to get a passport, right? It's so normal, I guess, because you need a document to go anywhere more than a couple of hundred miles in any direction, right? Yeah. Um, so that's that's interesting. Because <laughs> I, 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 I have no idea what that's like in American culture and outside of the coasts, you know? Yeah, yeah. I mean, because, I mean, you could go anywhere in America without needing yeah, it. And yeah. Uh, yeah, so I just never thought, well, I'm going to go fly to Europe someday or anything. So I just didn't have it, you know? And, um, but yeah, I was like, sure. So it turned out this guy had heard a guy playing guitar in Taipei and the guy was playing one of my tunes. He was playing she. Oh, and, what, a, uh, what a thief. What a thief. <laughs> well, it just turned out that, uh, <laughs> the guy had seen my MySpace page and had, oh, and wow. had learned it or, you know, something. So the, uh, the promoter is like, oh, that doesn't sound like an Asian music who is and he just said who is that what are you playing there and that's how he heard about me and wow so, so this was so <laughs> old school that yeah he heard about you through someone else performing your piece as if you were a classical composer writing it down and sending it to a family somewhere yeah that's the andy mickey record player was another human being yeah that's yeah that's that's incredible dude that's that's <laughs> no seriously and, and i i gotta weird. i gotta say on on i would like to think on behalf of both of us but certainly on behalf of myself um when somebody makes the effort to sort of sit down and learn oh uh, totally your tune i I, yeah. I i i've yet to kind of really feel like there's any higher compliment in one's own totally. creative worth uh yeah. self-worth really um mm -hmm. yeah it, it's it's insane because this this kind of music you know i mean i'm assuming everybody here um is aware of andy mckee's music you know um however if you haven't tried playing this kind of genre this style it it, it does it doesn't necessarily have to be supremely complicated, but typically it does take a long time to learn and a lot of commitment. That's why we have guitar tabs on our websites, because a lot of people need help learning this stuff. Learning this by ear is not the same as learning wasted years, you know, necessarily. Um, oh, wow, a wasted years fingerstyle cover. Has anyone done that? That could, that could be fun. That that's could be that's fun. right up your alley, bro. You should definitely. Well, yeah, I haven't got the 12 foot monster. <laughs> yeah, that's the thing. <laughs> Although uh, that would be a good excuse to get that going. Yeah, yeah. No, it really is a huge compliment. And, and, and to anyone to anyone listening who who does that kind of stuff, really, it, it, it means it means so much, truly. But that's that's yeah. so fa that's so fascinating that it was somebody else playing your tune that got you over there. And, and it yeah. is it, this 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 whole scene. Um, I've always done things very uh, a lot more kind of DIY until pretty recently. Um, I know since I, since you came over to the UK and I met you back when I was studying, playing concerts, you, you, you had a certain amount of infrastructure, you know, booking agent, things like this. But um, that whole get, uh, get an email come to your inbox asking if you want to play a show in country X and, and, and following <laughs> that path, that's, that's a very real part of this community and this scene. And I think, um, I, I don't know about yourself, but I always get a lot of questions about that. You know, how do you get gigs? You know, they'll see you play in this country. How does this happen? And uh, yeah, I always uh, find it so fascinating how this this grassroots approach has been so successful for so many people. Um, yeah. it's, it's really, really cool. But yeah, I, anyway, talking about that, back when I first met you as a, as a fan in the UK, uh, thank you so much for introducing me to uh, the great Tony McManus on one of those tours as well. Oh, yeah. Oh, Ed, you, you weren't familiar with him before? That or not at the time? No. Well, I I'd, I'd heard the name, but I hadn't uh, heard him play. You know, and, yeah. and you know, back back then you were doing a lot of tours in the UK, and you were bringing a lot of really interesting artists on the bill. Um, so thank you for that. Um, mm -hmm. And and I remember the sh a show with the great Petri Sariola at Union Chapel in London that you did. Thanks so oh, much man. for 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 that. That was a lot of night, uh, a lot of fun. I remember. Um, uh, I think you broke a string and I had to run run out of the audience to <laughs> oh, man, get yeah. you a string or something like that. Does that happen uh, often with all your tunings? Are, are you are you running into that? The only time that ever happens, and I'm just going to let everybody know, is when I'm lazy and I haven't changed the strings like Whoa, in two breaking, shows. Breaking it's news. my fault. It's totally my fault because, yeah, they, otherwise, you know, the strings are fine. But uh, usually they're good for like two or three shows. And then if I go fourth show, that must have been the fourth show because fourth show. Wow, it's yeah. inevitable. There's going to be a string break. This is such a common question. It's such a cliched answer as well, because almost every guitar workshop that Andy or I will have ever done will be questions about guitar strings. But it's very refreshing to hear you say that you change every couple of shows, because 
that's the same. And I'm just worried that uh, it, it's partly the breakage, but also I have this horribly corrosive sweat. I, I oh, sweat okay, yeah. like, you know, a teenager in a horror movie or something. <laughs> and it just kills the tone, typically. The brands can help with that. But uh, yeah, man, it's always the G-string, that dastardly G-string. Show number three, man. Yeah. It happens. Yeah. Kind yeah, of sucks. You can count on it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And you're with uh, Ernie Ball, correct? Yep. Yeah, yeah. Guys? I've been using their uh, Paradigm strings, uh, which they they uh, released the electric guitar version of those um, initially, and now they've got a, the acoustic guitar version of those, and um, they've been great. Yeah, can't complain. Nice one. Yeah, I remember I was working with Ernie Ball a few years ago on the al aluminum, as you say, the al aluminum bronze strings. And uh, yeah, good guys, good stuff. Um, but yeah, dude, uh, so something else I wanted to talk to you about is, now this is a bit out of left field. It's not a typical kind of thing. And a lot of people might not know about this. And I, I do hope you don't uh, wish I hadn't asked. I am nervous now. You no, know, you're, you're a man with you're an, you're a man with an impressive discography of fingerstyle guitar music. You've got, you know, six albums, a couple of EPs. But but the first album or the first release that's really not available has one of the most epic, epic art pieces. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I could pull it up here uh, and, oh, and, man, and, that and would be so good. Sh share that would be it with so good. the. The audience. I think the, I think the only time I've seen it is maybe on your phone or something in a private, <laughs> you know, a very closed doors. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. Don't share this. Well, you can't be ashamed of your past. You know, you can't live with regret. Here we go. This is really. This is what it looked like for everybody. Uh, okay. Can you got? Can you get the phone brightness up a hair? Yeah, that's. You can't really. Well, yeah, I see. You can't really see the the really hilarious part there. Um, so what yeah. we've got for the benefit of the recording is we've got the classic guitar, the guitar album, but there is something featured there. Um, well, could could you describe? Yeah, sure. So um, I had. Uh... <laughs> I'm so sorry. <laughs> no, it's but it's, it's not available, it, right? Actually. It's it's a collector's item. So yeah, you know. yeah. There was there was only a thousand ever made. So right on. There you go. But uh, um, yeah, I've always just been really. I, sometimes I'm like, whatever. Yeah, whatever. So like, when it came time to do the artwork for my first album. I was just like, yeah, whatever. This this guy was like, well, I got this idea. How about we go take a picture? We're going to call the album Nocturne, right? So how's about we go out at night and you stand next to this tree and uh, I'll turn on the headlights on my car and we'll get a couple pictures of you. And that should be cool. And I'm like, yeah, well, sure. I guess it's nighttime that I get it. And then so like a couple of weeks go by and he says, all right, I got the artwork all done. And I go and uh, he's added like two Black Panthers in front of me. And, uh, and, and which, which year was this? Just so we can imagine the, the Photoshop era graphic design is my yeah. passion vibe, right? <laughs> this is about uh, 2001 is when it was. My family didn't and, have uh, a computer in 2001. Oh, wow. Yeah. Man, that's oh, how that's long cool. ago we're talking. Yeah, man. And then, so yeah, the two Black Panthers were, su were a surprise to me. And, and uh, I was just like, yeah, okay. And then here's one final thing. I'm going to throw it up here one more time. You can see he took a Black Panther's eyeball, and that's the O on Nocturne. Oh, right on. Sick, huh? Pretty S sick. Dude, that's sick. That's <laughs> it's sick, bro. <laughs> That's really sick. Well, I, I, yeah. I un unfortunately do not own a copy of this, although one day I aspire to. Um, somebody actually emailed me the other day because I, I have my first EP um, on, which is called Reflections. I did it when I was at, at school. Uh, and again, it's like, I can't, I can't listen to it. It's too old and it's too amateur and you know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, and I was like, oh, dude, do you really, did you really have to buy that? <laughs> <laughs> you know, like thank you, but maybe you might want to check out this new newer thing. You know, but, oh um, man! So I haven't, you know, listened to the album in full. Although the content on it and the tunes are timeless, man. All these videos that you've put out over the years, all these songs that you've put out are absolutely timeless. And I've seen you play so many times, man. Like every time you came to the UK, I think I was, I was there. Um, Bristol, Aldershot, you know, London, all of this stuff. Um, but it's it's been a hot minute since you've released a record, right? Is is this yeah. kind of forced break, forced you, uh, or giving you some time to? to kind of do, do that or or are you waiting to do a different project because your last record was was it the live album yeah yeah that was the last one so yeah, yeah. yeah and that's been a few years so um yeah i actually i've got four things in the pipe for next year they're both they're they're both they're all kind of oh, wow. exclusive EPs actually yeah um and so they're each one kind of focuses on a different thing that i'm kind of into now and 
so the first one that's going to come out though, um, and we're hoping that's going to be in the spring is, uh, and, and I've got all, all the tunes pretty much recorded except for one. Uh, but it's a, uh, a covers, uh, EP. And, uh, it's, it's going to have tunes from the acoustic guitar players that really inspired me, but then, I'm also going to have the uh, uh, Rocky Four medley on there. That oh uh, no yeah. way! Wait, <laughs> yeah. this is this spring. We are recording this at the start of January. This is coming soon. A new Andy McKee EP featuring the music from the Rocky Four soundtrack. Yes, sir. Frank With Vince yeah. DiCola. Oh my god! <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, man. <laughs> I was, I was, I, I was thinking. I was like, you know, I, I saw you play with Vince. Now, talk about audio clipping, by the way. <laughs> I just reacted to that. Um, I, I, you, you played with Vince at the Musicarium camp. This was one of the coolest things that I've ever seen because you sat down there with your uh, your electric guitar, which is something that I hadn't you know, really seen you do before, yeah. um, playing with the master <laughs> live, you know, all the key changes, all the, the harmonies, all of the, now, now the training montage was what you played there. Is that, uh, are you allowed to say, you don't have to say, you can leave it a mystery if you want. Some, <laughs> but uh, it's uh yeah, it's going to be a medley of, uh, of war and training montage. Oh so. man. Man, so okay, so, so for any now, now I just watched Rocky Three the other day, actually. So uh, they're all out on Amazon Prime right now. So I'm kind of going through them. So Rocky Four is due uh, due a watch in the next couple of days. So so correct me if I'm wrong. Training montage is the one where he's where Dolph Lundgren is in the gym to, with taking all the steroids with all the scientists, and Rocky's in sort of you know the frozen north doing sort of deadlifts with haystacks and stuff like that. Right. Right. That's it. That's yep. it. And War mm -hmm. is the fight. Mm -hmm. Oh man, you got it. The, yeah. the, the so so Andy McKee, the the gentleman who released arguably the most important acoustic guitar piece since classical gas, uh, you know, is now doing the Rocky Four soundtrack with Vince Dakota. This is the greatest news I've ever heard. And I'm so happy. That's awesome, dude. Um, is it is it? it yeah. Are you playing electric on it, or is it like yeah. an acoustic working? Oh man, so this so this. Now I know you did that p the piano piece on the Mythmaker EP. Is this your first recorded electric guitar output? Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, there was uh, a little bit of electric guitar on uh, on that EP as well, uh, just a little guitar solo. But this is like a first, I guess, full tune. That's you know, that's uh, so exciting. Got the electric guitar rocking. And, yeah, man. So that's that's kind of a interesting thing on there. That's and then, so uh, that's so. I'm so excited. I'm so excited <laughs> because you know what that is. That is that is Andy McKee. Being a genuine freaking, as you are one of the most humble guys in the scene, and just one, of, you've just got such integrity to your to your person, really. And this to me is Andy waking up one day saying, "What do I want to do today? I want to do the Rocky Four soundtrack with Vince Dakota, and that's it." <laughs> you know, I, I, I remember, I remember there was a th there's a stage in every musician's development where you break through that barrier of uh, the question, "Is this allowed?" Like. Can I do this? Is this the right, right way to do this? You know, and mm -hmm. I remember watching your videos on YouTube, and you know, a lot of that set the framework for how people would present their own music as video for quite a while. You know, single shot, static back backdrop, you know, guitar live audio, that that whole thing. And then, you know, there will reach a point where someone will do something different, and maybe that becomes the new, you know, mm -hmm. and. Um, once you break through that, there's this incredible freedom, and I, I, something I've always uh, admired about you is that you never seem to have had any anything like that, any any barrier to pure creative freedom. And I think this would be a testament to that. You know, uh, something that's <laughs> very unexpected to a lot of people, man. And I can't wait for people to hear it. If it's what I think it is, based on what I heard you do at Musicarium, people are in for a treat because it was. I had a smile on my face just ear to ear. That's so exciting. <laughs> well, hello there, everyone. Apologies for the interruption to the podcast, but I did want to tell you about the amazing Tonewood Amp, the awesome sponsors of the show. Many of you will know already that I use this thing all the time, the magical little device that sticks with magnets to the back of your acoustic guitar, vibrates the back surface of the instrument so that reverb, delay, chorus, Leslie speaker effects, and other loveliness project out of the sound hole as if by magic. You're a wizard. I'm a what? You can head to MikeDawesHasAPodcast.com now to get more information about the Tonewood amp, as well as saving a tasty percentage for yourself. Let's get right back to it. In the spring as well. So you mentioned four, uh, four, uh, four, so four EPs, four EP series? Yeah. 
Yeah. So um, that's yeah. The covers one is it's essentially done. Um, and so there's I just got one more to record that's on harp guitar. And, uh, I just got that back because it was the pickup was damaged. But in any case, I'll be wait. So is, that. The, is this a whole EP of harp guitar pieces? No, no, no. It's it's mostly acoustic. Uh, then you've got the the Vince Ticola sort of Rocky Four thing, and then uh, then there's a harp guitar. Uh, well, actually, I'll, I'll go ahead and mention it. The harp guitar one is Streets of White Run from Skyrim, which I, oh, I did. Oh, dude, this yeah. is so exciting! <laughs> I did a video for that like a few years ago, um, and I just you know I need to get it out as a recording that people can have to to listen to. You know, oh, it's on think, YouTube. Yeah, I think I saw. I th- I think I I did see you post something like this a while ago on the harp guitar. Now, for anyone listening who doesn't know what we're talking about when we say harp guitar, could you ex- explain what that is? Because I, I I'd certainly never seen one of these things before. I saw your you know uh, some of your earlier earlier videos on YouTube. Sure. Yeah. It's uh it's it's like a guitar on uh, uh but it has this big arching uh sort of extension here that's part of the guitar body itself and. Uh, is hollow. And then over that part of the guitar, there's six sub bass strings, uh, that, uh, are run over. Actually, there's different numbers of, of strings that it can have, but the ones that I play have six sub bass strings. And, uh, I've been playing harp guitar, I guess, since about 2003 is when I got the first one. Uh, but I first heard it from Michael Hedges. Um, oh, well, there it is right there. There's a harp guitar. Oh, yeah, totally. So, so on the YouTube version of, of this, um, if you head over to the old YouTubes, uh, which which record is that? I can't see because you're so you're so small on my screen there. Oh, okay. It's it's that thing is called Strings of Steel. It was sort of a compilation that Wyndham Hill put together. Uh, right. But uh, yeah, but he plays it, you know, on uh, Live from the Double Planet. Uh, you can hear some couple harp guitar pieces on that from Michael Hedges. Uh, I, I wrote Into the Ocean and a tribute to Michael Hedges, the friend I never met. Um, and uh, yeah, the Streets of White Run from the video game Skyrim was on harp guitar as well. So. Brilliant. Your, fir- <laughs> your, your first video game theme tune, but not your first video game reference. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I did yeah, have yeah, yeah. Samus's Star Drive before, which is a reference to Metroid. You know, I've been playing a lot of Metroid recently. I've got this. Um, oh, yeah. This, the, yeah. I, I, well, I, at the start of this pandemic, just through timing, I and call it either good timing or bad timing. I would call it questionable timing. I, I bought a house, <laughs> my first sort of home, right? And um, for any sort of late twenty year old, early thirty year old, that's sort of the the big life commitment, you know. And um, absolutely, yeah. And a big financial commitment as well. So what a time for the uh, all the touring to stop. But um, <laughs> but, uh, really. but I but I did uh, yeah move into a uh, in an empty house with no furniture and no internet for a couple of months while the world burns, you know. <laughs> but um, everything's fine. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, just rocking backwards and forwards, you know. Everything is just fine, and we're but this. This episode will come out um, in approximately just just over a week, so we'll see if indeed everything is fine. Um, but um, <laughs> but yeah, I, I got myself a little arcade machine, um, and uh, as part of that, as part of that is uh, yeah, all, all the classics. I've been playing some uh, some Super Metroid on there. It's it's sort of like oh. an, an emulator kind of kind of box as well. Those cool. old games were hard. Oh you yeah, know, they they don't make them like that anymore. No, yeah, that's we were. It was trial by fire back in the day, man. You can't save that stuff, Mega Man. Are you kidding me? <laughs> <laughs> There's no saves, man. <laughs> There's no get out of jail free card. There's no resets. Oh man, I, I, yeah. I, have, I have been enjoying NBA Jam. That's been amazing On, with the oh, arcade interface. Yeah, yeah the tournament, uh-huh. the tournament edition. Um, so when, so in the UK. I just take this on a little bit of a tangent. In the UK, our lockdown procedure is that well, essentially, I'm by myself not doing anything, can't go anywhere. It's really bad here right now. Um, but throughout last year, it was also really bad, of course. But you were allowed to mix. W- if you were living by yourself, you are allowed to mix with one uh, other person who is also by themselves as a sort of support bubble. That's what it's called, you know. And I made my support bubble a guy who's really good at NBA Jam. <laughs> and, uh, so it's, it took a lot of time, but the tournament edition is the one where you can you can foul. And, oh, okay. Uh, you, you can get up to 25 fouls per game on a player because <laughs> e- e- each foul becomes an injury and they can get injured up to a maximum of 25. But each injury they sustain, the AI slows down and they start limping and it gets progressively worse. So we ended up doing the entire league with the single goal of winning every game by just injuring everybody. And we ended up the fourth quarter of each game would be sort of Scotty Pippen limping along just... <laughs> 
<laughs> good, good, good times, good times. Yeah. But uh, but no, I totally interrupted your uh, you uh, your other EP conversation. All uh, right, sure, yeah. yeah. Tangents on video uh, games, always fun. Oh yeah, I can always do that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so that's kind of the covers one. Um, the the one that's going to follow that is kind of a more synthesizer stuff, uh, but it's Whoa. like chilled out, um, kind of almost like relaxation uh, type stuff, you know, flutes and bells and whistles, um, but uh, just kind of ambient textural uh, synth music. And, okay. and so there'll probably be four or five tracks on that one. Um, I've got a, I've got one of those already done and uh, the other ones are kind of coming along, but uh, uh, and the one after that will be all new original acoustic stuff. Um, and then the one after that is going to be like an '80s inspired uh, type thing, which I've I kind of alluded to. I'm, I, as, as an Andy <laughs> McKee fan and a fan of all things '80s and video game, this is very very exciting. And uh, wow, yeah, I've I've put little hints, you know, about that kind of stuff on social media over the last couple of years, and yeah. so a lot of those things are kind of almost done. Um, and so I just need to finish those up, but that's going to be kind of the, the last one that that'll come out uh, probably towards the end of the year or maybe early next year. Okay, so uh, it's so it's very so. month a sort of a, a twelve month campaign splitting up these EPs. Mm -hmm. uh, so mm -hmm. a, a, enough content for probably a couple of albums in there, but but because they're so thematically different creatively, that was the decision to make them into EPs, I presume. Yeah, exactly. You know, it's um, like you said earlier, um, I can't remember. Oh, yeah, we were talking about like doing different things and all that. Uh, you know, so there may be people that just love the acoustic guitar. And so they're like not even curious about this right. meditation stuff or, or 80s sure. synth rock, you know. So that was kind of part of the reason I was like, well, I can break it up, you know. And if you just want to have this experience of solo acoustic guitar, here's this or. Yeah. Uh, yeah if so you if you don't like this one, then, you know, get fucked. Yeah, <laughs> you can fuck right off. <laughs> no, but but that's that's a beautiful thing, and you know, I, I do. When I was starting out with my sort of session gig, I did worry about that because I, I, I have the very fortunate position to open the shows, but also play with the front man of the Moody Blues, and it's my it's my dream gig. But I fully acknowledge that a lot of those people won't be into instrumental acoustic guitar and vice versa. If anyone perhaps follows me online and wants to come to a gig, they might want to see my opening set, but might not be into, you know, uh, classic rock and prog music. Right. Mm -hmm, um, so mm -hmm. it, 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 that going into this sort of touring musical world was a worry, but what I've realized is people's, first of all, people's people are very, very accepting of other tastes yeah. and open to other experiences. And I feel like since the, decline of of record stores and you know you go into the store and you'd have this is the metal section this is the rock this is the indie this is the folk i think people are, are less uh into just categorizing their music tastes you know I, I really do feel that i mean you look at anyone's um top listen to tracks on spotify and you can almost guarantee there'll be multiple genres in there you know so um you know i, I i'm pretty confident that i don't think anyone that's into the uh the uh, acoustic stuff is not going to be into the synth stuff. They're going to be into the Andy McKee stuff, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. And that's the thing. And, and, and no matter what you create through whatever vessel you create it, it's still going to sound like you. You know, it's going to be the best Andy McKee synth record of all time. <laughs> you know? The one and only. It's no, got to well, be. Well, I mean, maybe <laughs> no. not. Maybe, maybe not. more in the future. <laughs> maybe not. So, so is, is the, the the ambient synth stuff, is that also kind of 80s inspired or is that more sort of experimental and textural? It's more like if you're going to go get a back massage, what they oh, would be right having. Yeah, yeah, that kind okay. of thing. Going so for very... the, uh, Going for the, um, the, the, the massage stream playlists. With, with that guy, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Hit, 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 hit those, hit those spa, those spa plays, bro. Yeah, yeah. That's 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 awesome, man. Oh, really, really excited to hear those. That's wicked. Um, yeah, that's that's the super exciting to hear that it's coming so soon because uh, that's oh, that's maybe all warm and fuzzy. That's something to look forward to in twenty twenty one, everybody. Yeah, it's. I mean, it's 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 definitely been a while, you know. And even the last recording I did was a live thing, so it was you know tunes I'd already written years before that. So you know, and it, I, I'll be honest, it's like I've hit a bit of a creative wall sometimes, you know. And um, and even this, you know, not to get too political, but it, this is kind of weighed on me. What's going on in this country, you know? And sometimes it's just hard to focus, like you know. And as like an empathetic person, like a lot of us artist types are, you know, you you look around and you just shake in your head and you're like, what is going on? And you just feel confused and like disappointed. And, you know, it's sometimes it's hard to navigate that. It's, but. it's in no, I, I've, I really can't understand how acknowledging that, um, 
it's a crazy time is is a political statement in itself. It seems like everything's a political yeah. statement now. Like wearing a <laughs> like mask, you can't even... like wearing a, a like a public <laughs> safety issue is a political thing now. It, it's it's crazy, but it's not. It and is. on this on this podcast thing, you know, it's 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 not um it's not a uh silly thing to say that the world is in a very crazy place right now particularly in um uh the countries that we reside in so we have obviously right. the US with you know the the uh current transition of of administration and then in the UK we have uh an incredible uh number of uh, coronavirus uh casualties but we also have Brexit which was has been a long divisive issue that just happened which for anyone who doesn't understand what that is that's essentially um the the United Kingdom uh leaving the the European Union and the single market there it would be sort of the equivalent of Kansas leaving the US and all the uh, all the you know administrative ramifications that that would cause and all the chaos at borders and things like that you know so mm-hmm. it's it's a crazy time especially for traveling touring musicians who live through connecting with different people and cultures and places and yeah. you know i mean uh what you are saying about the creative block i'm in exactly the same situation and uh it's it's tough man it's been a really tough t- i managed to put out a live album last year because i don't think i would have been able to put out an, an an original album fortunately i was i had the content ready to go anyway i put out a single or two but um but yeah man i was on the phone to didario strings the other day um because i, I work with those guys and um they were hitting me up about doing a little a couple of little videos for them and i sort of said very frankly uh, they said, you know, when can you get this done by? And very frankly, I said, well, I have all this time in my calendar, so I, n- under normal circumstances, I could get it done by this time next week. But I'm not right. I'm not yeah. right, and it's going to take a little bit longer. I mean, and and they, on the phone, they were like, no worries, we totally get it. Like everyone's struggling with with that kind of stuff right now. So shout out to Dodario for being super understanding about, you know, what everyone's going through. And they're in New York, you know, which is which is obviously a pretty pretty crazy place. But um mm-hmm. but we wish everybody well, uh, both psychologically yeah. and physically, you know. But mm-hmm. no uh no disrespect to any artists that are not feeling creative uh, during early 2021 or 2020. It's it's how it is, man. It's how it is and and it's it's also opened up the opportunity to have chats and record them and stick them on the internet with old friends, yeah. which is a lot of fun, man. <laughs> yeah, you started this podcast uh, just recently, right? You, yeah, you, you are. Just... You will be episode number six, I think. Episode number six. So Khaki Kings cool. coming going out uh, just before you, which will be a couple of days from now when we're recording this. Yeah, it's just an opportunity to catch up with other musicians, but also meet musicians I've always wanted to meet and chat to and um and 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 learn about what makes them tick as well it's it's more conversational than like an interview you know yeah, uh, yeah and 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 that and part of the whole 2020 2021 thing is that you know we haven't chatted in a while and and let's catch up and 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 it's nice to share little industry tidbits as well for people listening who are trying to think about how to get into the into the scene you know and uh, and have these crazy experiences. And speaking of crazy experiences, something that uh, some of your fans won't know is that you actually had the opportunity to not just tour with the amazing Dream Theatre in these big, old, fuck-off, massive halls, but also the late, great, mighty Prince of all people, oh, wow. um, which must have been the most insane experience I could possibly comprehend. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that was pretty crazy, man. Uh yeah, that was uh, a huge honor, of course. And, um, um, you know, I just another crazy thing that just came out of nowhere. So like his management got a hold of mine and that was, I think this is like 2011 and, uh, said that he liked what I was doing and would be interested in, you know, meeting and whatever. So I was like, what in the world? And so it was all real, you know, and I flew to, uh, uh up to Minneapolis and, uh, met him at, at Paisley Park and his, uh, drummer and bass player. And, uh, you know, we just chatted a bit and, and, uh, and played a little bit. And then, you know, we, then we played ping pong. He was like way into ping pong and whoa, not yeah. just basketball then. No. Yeah. He was, he was like, and, and so like, he always had a ping pong table backstage. Um, uh, and <laughs> so like, man, it was just crazy, you know, and, uh, was he amazing so, at it? Was he just amazing? Oh yeah, he, good at he ping pong? defeated everybody. Like we all played him, you know, and he was just like Olympic level ping pongist. 
<laughs> yeah, but uh, you know, he had me play some of my solo stuff, and then we jammed like a little bit. And I'm not even, man. I think I really suck at jamming. I'm just not really. I don't know what, what's up with my brain when oh, it comes dude, to jamming. I, I, I just, I, I, I'm the same. And and what's really bad is that is that there are some like top tier guitar heroes of mine that think that I'll be able to jam with them. And I'm sort of just like Homer Simpson backing into the hedge. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> just disappear. Yeah. The alternate tunings. You, you, you live your life playing in a different tuning every day. You know, you, yeah. you lose the licks somewhat. Uh, <laughs> totally. Yeah. Like standard tuning and doing all the licks. I totally forgot how to do any of them. Uh, yeah. But yeah. So, but anyway, you know, that was the first meeting. And then he had me come up again and rehearse like a bunch of tunes with the band to go do shows in Australia. And so, um, that was a crazy year, 2012. That was when I did, uh, like Asia with dream theater. And then immediately we went from Thailand to Australia and played with Prince down there. And we did like three nights in Sydney and Melbourne and Brisbane, three nights in each one. Whoa. And, uh, yeah. I and didn't it realize, was I didn't realize crazy. it was that many shows. I think I would have seen the, the, the cities, but didn't realize you were doing multiple nights in each, each venue. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, you know, that he was really meticulous about, he had people like removing videos and stuff. So there's almost no record of it, you know, like wow. on YouTube, I think there's like one video where you can see me down there, but I think that only was released after he passed away. Even a and uh, uh, master, master con man. It's all uh, a lie. He was never there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It was never happened. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, yeah, it was, it was really nuts, you know, and, but just an, a huge honor and, um, I, but at the end of it, you know, I even told him, you know, uh, I, I felt weird about it. It's not, wasn't really my thing. You know, I, I, I couldn't, I couldn't be Prince's guitar player. That's just not who I am as a musician. You know, it's not like what I sure. ever, you know, wasn't my goal or anything. And I, I wanted music for me is like about expressing myself. And so if I'm going to sure. go do something, um, I want to have some creative part of it. You know, I feel that's the fulfillment of it. And so I said, like, if you ever want to, you know, do like an acoustic album of like covers of your tunes and rearrange it. And I was like, man, let me know. I'd love to do it. And so he said, all right, I'll let you know. And so um, I never heard anything for a couple of years went by. And then I think it was in December, just a few months before he passed away. He was, I got another email. and was like interested in doing that acoustic thing. And I was like, oh my God. Yeah. And then, uh, in, I think it was in April, he had passed away. So that never happened. But, wow. um, but still, uh, it was just a huge honor to have someone of his caliber. You know, I mean, I don't know if everybody knows, like he wrote those tunes. He plays all the instruments. I mean, the guy really was a next level type of, you know, musician. And, and just to have had that, uh, just to know that he liked what I was doing and that we had that experience together was really cool, really amazing. And, and that's amazing. An honor. Yeah. Absolutely, I could imagine. I mean, Prince was the the king. I mean, you know, it, the prince was the king. Prince yeah. was the king. I mean, <laughs> I mean, and and one thing that uh, that is maybe worth noting is there's, I think, now a bit more access to. Now, I, guess, I presume the labels have taken over somewhat. There's more access to his discography, just generally online. Um, so, for anyone who, yeah. who hasn't discovered Prince's music uh, now, is is pretty a pretty good time to do that. Um, even the uh, start with the Batman. Uh, sounds like. <laughs> <laughs> now that that would have been an amazing Andy McKee Prince collaboration, by the way. <laughs> Throw, throwing that out there. So, do, do, do something else about your um, your playing is that you've obviously inspired a generation, really, of of guitar players. And I I don't say that lightly. I'm not just trying to make nice conversation. Like, really, that that uh, first explosion on YouTube is the reason that a lot of players, like certainly like myself and, and people of my similar kind of age bracket, and the, by proxy and also directly younger still, um, got into the style of music, the, the fingerstyle guitar, you know, instrumental thing. Um, and therefore, uh, what you have to say on the subject is 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 rather biblical and carries a lot of weight. Um, I've noticed that you're doing a, a little bit more teaching nowadays in the pandemic uh, online. Are you doing um, you doing sort of live lessons or is it sort of a video exchange thing? Yeah, it's uh, I, I I signed up with True Fire to do a, a guitar channel. Um, I, I did a guitar course with them before where I taught. Uh, like four or five tunes. Um, and so when they started doing these channels, uh, you know, our mutual manager, Brian, uh, had told me about it and, and said that they were interested in doing that. And I thought, well, what better time than now? 
Um, because kind of at the start of this pandemic, you know, I was thinking, well, what can I do to, what can I do? I mean, yeah. <laughs> to just stay active a bit. <laughs> and so what do I do? Yeah. Yeah. And so I put a couple of sort of instructional things on YouTube on my channel. Um, and then Brian had mentioned that we could do this thing with Truefire. And I said, well, sounds good. So, um, it's a channel where you can subscribe. I think it's, I'm not sure what the prices are, to be honest, but there's a few different tiers and the base tier is uh, you get access to, I think it's a little over 50 videos already where I break down my songs and uh, talk about techniques and some of the guitar players that inspired me and uh, different tunings. And uh, that's like one of the tiers. And then there's another one where you get access to all that. And then you also get one monthly lesson with me personally. And uh, yeah, and that's like a video exchange thing. Uh, and then there's another tier where it's like weekly, we do a lesson and you get access to all the videos. And um, so, and then we also just started doing a workshop once a month. So at the end of, I think it's the last Saturday of every month, anybody that's subscribed to the channel at all, you can ju jump in this Zoom thing and we can ask questions and blah, blah, blah. And it's pretty blah, fun. blah, blah. That's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You get the, so, so the pandemic, yeah, it's obviously it's a terrible thing, but it's it's it has certainly opened up a lot of access to people's favorite musicians that they might not have otherwise had. Um, I was reading an mm -hmm. article yesterday that said, I think it was it was Tesla, some other company, and Truefire are, are companies of note that have just exploded uh, the last year. So specifically, Truefire was noted in this. I think it was Financial wow. Times or Wall, maybe even Wall Street Journal or something like that. Uh, I believe they just exploded and a lot of artists like yourself are using that particular platform to do tuition. So it's really worth checking out. I, I was, I was taught, Brian's been on me a lot to do the TrueFi thing and, I, and I've committed and I am going to do it. Um, but I, I think I need to go back to the aforementioned um, uh, slow pandemic brain, um, you know, in terms of that. But I have something similar on Patreon, but it's a little less educational specifically and a little more sort of just chatting and, uh, and you know, uploading things first and exclusives. And there is some educational back and forth as well. But I think I will do a true fire as well, because it sounds like something that's a lot of fun to create and also pretty rewarding for the people using it, I would assume. I mean, um, you probably got a nice little family on there of, of, of fans you've got to know and they, they, exactly. They're closer yeah. to you, and it's it's like having that that connection that you have maybe uh, out out in the lobby at the end of a show, actually getting to meet the people who give a crap about what you're doing. You know. Yeah, exactly. It really is, man. Yeah, it is. It, you say it's rewarding for them. It's rewarding for me too. And and uh, you know, I've got I got a guy in Japan, a guy in Russia. You know, people in the states, people in Canada, and and it is. It's just cool to have that sort of connection that that we used to get at the end of the night and you know, shake hands and interact with the fans and stuff. So it's, that's been really, really nice. Totally. Yeah. I've been doing every Sunday I've done sort of, um, I do three like zoom slots, like little, little lessons just to have that, that interaction with people, you know, which is, it's been a lot of fun. And honestly, having that kind of routine is kind of keeping me sane through all of this because, uh, mm -hmm. when you're on tour, I think one of the really cool things about, uh, living on the road is that, you know when there's lobby call. You know when your meal's coming. You know when the sound check is. You know when the show is. Did I do a good job? Yes or no? Uh, and, and there's a validation from that uh, pretty instantaneously. Um, in the same way, you maybe having a boss saying "good job," uh, you have an audience that are either well, they're either enjoying themselves or they're not. There's there's a direct um, sort of response to the energy that you're putting out there, and that's that's something that I really missed this year is uh, is that kind of routine, uh, you know. Mm -hmm. So uh, that sounds like a really really cool project, man. Yeah, it's it's a really mm -hmm. cool platform. I, I've I've browsed it doing my little research, and I'm thinking of putting something together as well. Do you go deep on gear there? Because um, I, you are obviously a a bastion of uh, the uh, uh, the higher end guitars, the the amazing Michael Greenfield, uh, that uh, guitars you've been playing for quite a long time. You have a, a relatively mm -hmm. new, uh, you have a relatively new model with him, or did I see yeah. you were producing a, a number of Greenfields? Yeah, yeah, I, I do go into to gear on the channel some, you know, um, but I, I don't. I guess there's probably like four videos because I don't really have a whole lot. Of gear. <laughs> it's like, oh, this is the capo I use, and here's the. But um, but yeah, I've been I've been using Michael's guitars for a long time now. Um, I guess maybe about twelve years or so uh, officially, uh, something like that. And um, now these guitars, yeah. these guitars are, are special. These are not uh, necessarily, or maybe they are in the future. Um, I, I've rarely seen a Greenfield at the local guitar center. You know, um, these mm -hmm. are bespoke, handmade, top quality instruments made in Canada. 
Mm -hmm. Right. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Michael's uh, up in Montreal and uh, has a a shop there. I discovered him actually at the Canadian Guitar Festival in 2004, I think it was. And uh, he had guitars, you know, on display for everybody. And I was just amazed. Um, And so that's how we kind of first met. But um, yeah, that's that's I've been using his guitars that long. And we just released the signature model, which has uh, been you know, really cool. We've, we've sold uh, some of those and, um, it's just cool to think that, you know, I've from going from seeing his guitars on display there and thinking, wow, I, I'll never own one of these to having a signature model with him, wow. uh, was, was, has been cool. Um, but yeah, I love those guitars. They, they sound great and look great. And, and, you know, they have the fan fret guitar neck to and, help with and intonation. That, that big as well. Big boys. Yeah, I do. I like the. I like. I've always kind of went towards the jumbo size guitars, which yeah. is always weird because I'm not very tall or anything. So when I play one, it looks like I'm, I'm a freaking I don't know a halfling or something. It's it's part uh, of you. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's just part it's, of the look. It's a singular <laughs> object unit. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I I I tried playing one. I think it was a. a is it G one or G four? I forget. Um, but it was in um uh, the North American Guitar Showroom in London. Um, oh, yeah, okay. They have uh-huh. with, with Michael Watts, you know, uh, or mm-hmm. formerly with Michael Watts, and they have um, have some there and, and amazing guitars. But I, I just feel intimidated I, 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 by these instruments. I I, I play so quietly and in, introspectively, and, and, and this thing is just like a grand piano attached to you, you know. So uh, <laughs> pr- pr- yeah. props for being able to control that beast. Um, yeah. And that's something that I probably should have mentioned when talking about the harp guitar is your your ability to control. I go deep into the the right hand stuff and, and the super nerd, nerd nerd stuff that maybe some people won't pick up on, but your ability to control the resonant strings on those kind of instruments and the harp guitar as well, of course, is is really incredible. It's something that um, I always see some always try and inform students about is you know uh, that the damping and being in control of everything with your right hand it's super important. And uh, I was actually listening to your. Um, your Tears for Fears cover earlier, the uh, Everybody Wants to Rule the World. And man, I can't, I still can't figure out what that thumb's doing. I don't, I just, <laughs> I just don't get it. I just, I just don't. And, and, and who is it that covered it? Was it Danny, Danny Choi played it oh, at, yeah. at the Musicarium? Yeah. And he's That's doing right. it as well. And I'm like, what, what, what are you doing with your thumb? I don't, I don't understand what you're doing. Um, so if, guys, if you if you don't know the arrangement, there's a great video of it online. A few, plenty of videos of you playing it online. You know, um, check it out and get the tabs and give it a go. Because uh, <laughs> and then tell me what it is that you're doing because I I have no idea, dude, at all. To be honest, I don't Do know you, what I'm doing either. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's the uh, that's the bug for this podcast. Yeah. It's just Andy McKee, <laughs> vital guitar information. I don't. I, 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 I don't I know. Don't. <laughs> He, he doesn't know what he's doing. That's all. It's all. It just kind of. It just kind of escalated, didn't it? You just yeah. put a. You just put a. Put a video out and just kind of kept saying yes to things. And here you are. <laughs> Here's a new song. <laughs> I guess kind of like it, you know. Uh, yeah, it's it's well, you, you know. Actually, talking about just just things happening. Um, I I I'm getting super apprehensive now about releasing new stuff. I'm going to release another. Uh, new single with with a couple of electric guitar electronical guitar collaborators pretty soon as a single but um i feel like putting stuff out now like original music on youtube is really hard man i feel like it's yeah. it's so hard to stand out amongst the memes you know um i i i felt like back back when i first started which was freaking 6 7 years after you emerged on onto the platform it was like here is an artist and a song enjoy no now you know it, it's it's it, you know do i title my song with its song name or do i title it uh i'm running late and just got out the shower here's a song you, you, you know what i mean that there's this 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 memeology that you have to inject into songs to seemingly get them get them heard on on a visual platform at least and uh, uh-huh. and and sometimes i feel like that with with other uh, platforms as well um do, do you mm-hmm. have any 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 takes on that am i just being paranoid am i just being am i just trying to make up for the fact that I'm just very apprehensive about releasing music in 2021. I don't know. <laughs> the world uh, changes, you know. They, yeah, absolutely. Man, that is that is for sure. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Have you seen uh, the news? <laughs> <laughs> well, like, yeah, man, I, 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 yeah, when I look at stuff like YouTube and, um, 
these days or whatever, you know, it, it does kind of seem like it's gotten a bit away from just, and the, just the music, you know, it's like, you've got to do something clever. It needs to do this. It needs to do that. Blah, 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 blah. And I mean, when I get these new EPs done and, and, uh, I've had this first one with the covers. I mean, I'm, it's going to be old school. It's just going to be, be me playing the song. Um, and if you like the music job done, job well done, you know, it's like, I don't need to have, I don't need to see somebody doing this and that and playing basketball while they play guitar or, you know, riding a unicycle, riding a unicycle. It just, it doesn't mean anything to me when, you know, it's just, it seems, it's really kind of degrades the music to me. It's like you, what you, you can't stand behind your music. You got to do all this other nonsense, you know, it's, it's, Um, it's interesting because (laughs) it's interesting because that's, that's just my perspective. No, no, it's, and you know, as, as an old soul myself who is encountering, this level of change, this shift for really the first time in his life as a 31 year old, you know, because change happens all the time. We went from reading newspapers to watching the news, you know, we, uh, this, this happens every X amount of years. And this would yeah. be the first time that I've been in a professional situation where the landscape has shifted so much. So obviously I'm aware of it. Obviously I, you know, idolized the past and, and, and how seemingly simple things were. Um, obviously it's an inevitable, it's obviously it's a change that is not going to be reversed anytime soon because that's not how change works. It's a, it's a, it's a progression, you know, that's the nature of progressive thinking. Right. But, um, mm-hmm. it, it's, it's almost like, uh, you, you are doing genuinely what you want to do at all times. We've already established this through the fact you're doing an 80 synth EP and a Rocky four soundtrack. You're doing creatively <laughs> what you want to do at all times. And at the end of the day, it's either going to be fashionable at that moment in time, or it's not going to be fashionable at that moment in time. And and the difference to me between an artist and a content creator is is that it's do I give a crap about whether what I'm putting out right now is in is fashionable right at this moment? You know, it may well be, it may not be. But if your intent is just I don't care about that, then that makes you an artist, and that's your job. Andy Mickey is an artist. You know, I, I think this this needs to be taught that there's a difference between content creation and art there really there really is some of it so much of it is to do with intent but at the end of the day the platform will provide what the platform provides and just like in your pre-youtube world uh, your music got out there from a human being covering it and in the post youtube world it got out through <laughs> through being on the front page which doesn't exist anymore as a feature you know it's uh-huh. it's 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 an interesting time and it's it's just so awesome that in the community we have someone like yourself who is at the level that you're at that is maintaining that artistic integrity. It's 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 really, really cool and, and fills anyone with a crippling self-doubt with a lot of confidence. So <laughs> Oh man. Well, I I'm not immune to crippling self-doubt either though. Uh, you know, I I, I, I uh, No artist you know, is always, yeah, no, I don't think any artist would be yeah, it's true. Um you've always uh wondering, I guess, if I mean, especially, you know, I've got a wife and kids and so it's like, yeah, I need to make sure I'm taking care of things and all that. But, um, for some reason, the whole music and guitar thing, it's like, I just can't, uh, force something that isn't real. It just yeah, feels, yeah. it feels so bad if, if I were to, I just would feel like I was lying to myself and to everybody yeah. and that would feel worse than anything else. So Same. do, do, do cr- <laughs> yeah. creatively what you want to do at all times. Yeah. Um, yeah. you know, there was a, um, now this is in no, uh, not to go too deep into this, although I do find it a really fascinating discussion to have with professional musicians. Um, a friend of mine uh, works at a music school, um, but it's it's not like a traditional music school here in the UK. It's one of these go there and learn guitar, bass and drums and kind of like a, a Berkeley type thing, um, but a little bit smaller. It's a new one that's opened up uh, somewhere in the country. I don't want to give too much away. I don't want to... But um, they did a, uh, a little informal poll at the end of a, a class that was sort of just like, you know, what do you want to do in the music industry when you graduate? And uh, supposedly, and this is secondhand information, uh, 80% of the, I say kids, 80% of the kids there wanted to review guitar pedals on YouTube. No. Yeah. (sighs) (laughs) As in that's, that's the primary, that's the primary uh, goal to it. The goal. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) 
I want oh, to man. learn this instrument so I can effectively make YouTube videos reviewing gear. And hey, I, I, I've been putting out some gear review videos recently as well. I, I'm, I'm enjoying it. Uh, it's, uh, it's not the same buzz as doing a live show by any means. Um, it's mm. something nice to do in the month of January, you know. Um, sure. But yeah. I mean, as a, I just found that really fascinating um, that aged 18, 19, 20 year olds, um, uh, that's 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 the number one thing. And again, no no disrespect to that as a pathway. That is clearly something that interests a lot of people. I find that really interesting. Um, uh, but it almost has nothing to do with music, doesn't it? I mean, that's the thing. That's the thing. It's just. It's, I mean, it's, it's like it shouldn't even be in the same ballpark. It's, it's, yeah, it, it's a. <laughs> and it's it's like you need you need to learn to be competent at your instrument to the point that you can sell gear. But that's not aspiring to excel at any particular craft, you know. And like I think, expressing yourself and trying yeah. to connect with other human beings on a deep level, you know, music. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but but boobs and filters, Andy. It's twenty twenty one. Like you know, right, come man. on, come on, get with it. Come, come on. on, Grandpa. <laughs> <laughs> I know, dude. I really do start to. There's days where I feel like, man, I'm like the old man now. I like, I like don't get it anymore. I'm like out of touch, and uh, you know, like what the. You know, it's really old. really interesting. <laughs> what's really interesting to um to to any younger person, and I, I I'm because I crossed the thirty threshold, so I'm I just turned thirty one. And yeah. I know a lot of people listening are going to be older than 31. Shut up. You're young, blah, blah, blah. But you know what? <laughs> when you look at the Instagram community, I, I feel old as well. Yeah, um, I bet, dude. You know, but what's yeah. really interesting is like, you know, this house was basically bought by CD sales. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like yeah. CD sales at concerts. And you are never going to find a music education course that tells you going out on the road and selling CDs to people is 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 a worthwhile thing. This is stuff <laughs> we learn by ourselves by by sort of getting out there and seeing what the world's like. And I, I find that so interesting. Um, this 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 there's no money in being a musician mentality is simply just not true. Uh, that's not to say that you know I, I left school thinking I want to sell loads of CDs. That's that's my goal, you know. But right. uh, th there's <laughs> if if being if, if if putting art out into the world is worrying you because you feel that it's not a sustainable thing. Um, I mean, it's a hard thing to do. It's a very competitive thing to do, but it one hundred percent is a sustainable thing if you if, if if you're honest and you work hard at it. You know, just like any any discipline. I, mm -hmm. I thought I thought I'd share that a little anecdote with you because I thought it was really interesting and it was really interesting to see your reaction as well, which is the same reaction, exact reaction that I had, and the same exact <laughs> reaction that a lot of friends of mine had who are the professional gear reviewers. You know, yeah. it's like these guys, are like, what are you doing? Like, do something with you know, get out there, create art. You know, it's really interesting, man. Um, dude, I, 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 I got to give a shout out to the the Tone with Amp guys for for basically enabling oh, yeah. this this podcast to happen. I know you're a you're a user of the uh, of of the gadget. Do you have that on your on your new guitars as well? Like the the, the brace installed. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. Um, the Tonewood amp, man. I, I, I remember seeing it when it was, uh, you know, like a Kickstarter, I think, and just being like, wow, what is this possible? What is this sorcery? Right. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. I, I, so I became like a backer on the, on that back then. Um, and, and it's just, it's been, oh, wow. great. You, you were one of the original people funding the creation of the device. Yeah. Yeah. I, I was really impressed, you know, and, and have been impressed with the results and I love it, man. Uh, especially on the road, you know, like if you're in the hotel or backstage and you just want some reverb, you know, you kick that on and it sounds great. And yeah, I, yeah, I can't recommend it highly enough for anybody that plays acoustic guitar to check it out. Totally. Yeah. It's, 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 it's the one thing that is, uh, I always call it the inspiration box. I'm a bit of a broken record here. Here we are talking about not being creatively inspired, but, uh, one thing's for sure, uh, you know, that helps. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, dude, dude, a a a a Andy McKee, R Randall McPhee himself. Thank you so much for, uh, for coming on and having a catch up, man. It's been so good to talk to you. Do you have any, yeah. uh, any anything you want to, want to share, uh, find any, any final thoughts, Jerry Springer's final thoughts? Shoot, man. Wow. That's a nice throwback to it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, be good to yourselves and each other. No, <laughs> that was always how we did in the that's, show. But that's, um, a, that's another bug. Uh, <laughs> these, 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 I really should be making notes of where these points are. That's fantastic. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> little timestamp. Yeah, yeah. I need, to, I need to figure that out. I'll get a little timestamp button. Be excellent uh, to each other. 
be excellent. Yeah, I guess you know we covered a lot of the stuff that's going on. You know, I guess uh, just to just to recap uh, that stuff. If you know you're into the acoustic guitar and want to uh, check out what I'm up to, I'm doing the True Fire course. It's called the Joy of Playing on there. So, um, and there's a few different uh, subscription options there if you'd like to do that. And uh, got the new music coming out this year. And hopefully we're going to do Musicarium and have Mike out and uh, along with Trevor Gordon Hall, Callum Graham, Antoine Dufour, and Muriel Anderson and Michael Mannering too, will be making an appearance again. So, um, yeah, dude, I guess it's, yeah, it's, it, but it's just been nice to see you too, man. Nice to catch up. And, uh, um, I hope we can get together this summer in California. Yeah. Fingers crossed. It was a lot of fun. Um, the other year, the musicarium and, uh, and it was great to hear Michael Mannering's coming back as well with his massive bass rig. Yeah. Um, yeah. That's... He's got a new album. That's awesome too. People should check out Michael oh, nice. Manning's new album. Yeah. There's some really, really great solo bass tracks on there. So fantastic. Well, as, as, as always do give Andy a, a, a follow and, and check out what he's up to. Um, the true fire thing is a really great way to connect with him, uh, which obviously we don't know how long, uh, you know, pro touring artists, uh, like Andy are going to be doing the online educational thing because who knows what happens in the future. So, so jump on it guys. Randall McPhee, it's been a pleasure to, and uh, take care and hope to see you in July, all things being well. Lots of love, man. Sounds good, brother. Take care of yourself. Hey guys, thanks so much for checking out this week's episode of the podcast. For more information about this week's guest, head to the link in the description where you will also find more information about the Tonewood amp as well as that cheeky little discount you can get as well. Lots of love. See you next time. 